Next up, we have Nick Carter, who's going to talk about the last 10 years of Bitcoin, especially the performance as a monetary system. We are very, very excited to have you, Nick. Hi, my name is Nick Carter. Um, I'm a partner at Castle Island Ventures, uh, here to talk about uh, Bitcoin's monetary uh, qualities. I want to thank the ex... Thank you, uh, Hugo, and the excellent team at the Expo uh, for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Uh, so the, uh, the title is a bit of a misnomer, actually. Um, the talk is mostly about Bitcoin's long-term uh, monetary sustainability. Uh, so just looking back briefly over you know, the first 10 years, I think it's been a, an astounding uh, 10 years. Uh, and the, you know, the two data points that I think are the, are the most important um, are you know, the transaction count to some degree, but really the, the value flowing through the system, um, which is, you know, in the last couple of years, it's been uh, between a billion and $10 billion a day, uh, which I think is extremely impressive for a, a new, um, you, you know, monetary system. Um, and, you know, everyone in the press tends to be obsessed by transactions per second, et cetera. I think what matters is the fact that Bitcoin settles, you know, a, a couple billion dollars a day on average. Um, but, you know, the question is, what does the future hold? And everybody is talking about the, the you know, the, the decline in, in the block rewards over time. The next halving is, I think, next year even. Um, and the, the fee market um, is inevitable. Um, and I believe integral to the success of Bitcoin in the very long term. So we've seen the fee market being modeled uh, in a bunch of ways. People are trying to guess at what average fees on a per transaction basis will have to be for Bitcoin to be considered secure in the long term. You know, you'll see estimates, $15 fees per transaction. But that actually puts the cart before the horse a little bit. Uh, the question is, what should an appropriate level of security expenditure be for Bitcoin, you know, for it to be considered secure? And this is very much an open question, one that I think we don't have enough discussion on. So that's why I wanted to talk about it today. Uh, and, you know, right now, Bitcoin spends about $2.3 billion a year on security. And so that goes into buying ASICs, um, you know, and electricity. Um, so the question is, is that too high? Is that too low? We actually don't know. Bitcoin seems to be safe, but we're not certain whether that, you know, is an appropriate number. Um, so then the question is, what actually is the security model over the long term? And I'm not going to talk sort of niche adversarial conditions because... Uh, th that's not something I know a lot about, but I'm going to talk in broad strokes here. Um, so, you know, what does our Lord and Savior Satoshi have to say about this? Um, he says, well, if, um, you know, an attacker has, it can be overpowered by, you know, all, all of the honest players in the system, then Bitcoin is assumed to effectively be secure. Um, and th there was a lot of discussion in the early days of Bitcoin because there was no formal proof of this. It, it worked in practice and not in theory which really scares academics. They don't like that. Um, so S Satoshi, you know, he, he, this was re he didn't actually give us that much detail on the security model, which is okay. So he kind of left us to fill in the gaps. Um, so the main contention of this talk is that there's a few ways to think about Bitcoin security. Um, and uh, again, I think there's been maybe insufficient discussion about this, you know, in Bitcoin land. Uh, so if you ask most Bitcoiners why Bitcoin is safe, what many of them will say is that Bitcoin spends an overwhelming amount of money on security and, and you know, hashes on security, right? Um, so, you know, trillions of hashes and billions of dollars a year go into buying ASICs. And those ASICs are really, you know, they're non-repurposable, so they're exclusive hardware. So miners have a long-term alignment. Um, and, and then if you, if you simplify that down, the idea is simply that uh, there's a very high threshold of expenditure at which Bitcoin is understood, you know, to be secure. Um, so if you ask, um, you, you know, high profile um, Bitcoiners, many of them will answer this. And I've, I can tell you that because I have been asking them. Um, so, so the idea here, here is that, you know, you need, you know, one Three Gorges dam worth of electricity um, and you need to own an ASIC foundry in order to acquire the resources, um, you know, to attack Bitcoin. So that's very difficult and so far, Nobody's been able to do it. Um, then there's a, a more subtle approach here, which, which is what I call the stock model. Um, uh, 
which is essentially the idea that um, you should index the security expenditure to the value of what you're protecting, which is you know, the aggregate value of all the Bitcoins. Um, so th that's a little different from threshold because it implies that as Bitcoin grows, you should be spending more and more on security. You know? So that is contrary to the threshold model. And then recently there's this paper by Eric Badish, an economist at UChicago, where he says, actually, uh, you should contemplate uh, really large transactions in 51% attacks, and then you, sh you should spend a lot in fees. You know, 30% of, of, uh, of transaction volume should be spent in fees, which is really a lot. Um, and I think it was a compelling paper, but um, I probably don't have enough time to go into that here, so we're, we're just going to leave that aside for now. So really, we're going to talk about threshold and stock models uh, of security, although I do recommend the Badish paper. So to... Um, to d d you know, talk about the threshold model uh, quickly. Um, this is really the idea, is that there's some level of sort of annualized security spend at which Bitcoin is safe. And, you know, the problem is that we don't really know where it is. Bitcoin isn't being attacked now, so perhaps 2.3 billion is, is enough, but maybe um, it, it could be less. There are many, you know, secure chains that don't spend uh, what Bitcoin spends on security, right? So there are many... Uh, much smaller chains that seem to be okay. Um, so we don't know where it is, and it's sort of an unsatisfying model, perhaps. Uh, the, the stock model, I think, makes a little bit more sense. Um, so the idea is that as the system is more capacious um, and as the, the returns from an attack grow, um, you know, think about a short-selling attack where you sabotage Bitcoin in some way and you short-sell. If Bitcoin's worth a trillion dollars, the returns from that, that attack you know, will, would justify um, spending more on the attack, right? So as the, the prize grows, um, you, you know, the, the cost to attack, um, you know, attackers in theory would have more resources because the prize is significant. Uh, so the idea is that Bitcoin should index its security expenditure to something like market capitalization. But that, as we all know, is actually not how Bitcoin works. Uh, it doesn't have a, a stable rate of inflation, um, uh, you know, this is what we all like about Bitcoin. Uh, the, the issuance and the, the security expenditure uh, is dropping every four years through the halvings. And, and so far, the fees are not compensating for that. Even at the height of the, free, the fee crisis, fees were only about 25, 30% of security spend, right? So because we want Bitcoin to be scarce, um, we do have to drop the issuance and eventually transition onto the fee model of security, right? Um, so fees will constitute Bitcoin's security budget in the long term. And I'm not saying today, not even saying in, in 10 years, but there will be a transition. And what I'm trying to do is just anticipate this. Uh, and, and, and Satoshi agrees. He says the incentive will transition entirely to transaction fees, right? So uh, the existence of fees on Bitcoin is what ensures scarcity to some degree. Um, so, you know, th this is a trade-off that I think a lot of proof-of-work chains, and, and even proof-of-stake chains, actually, um, will face. And, and there's this kind of transition to maturity um, as, as they start with a high issuance regime, you know, all securities funded by inflation, and they move to kind of a high fee regime. Um, and, and so Bitcoin has already begun to do this and is very credible about doing this. Um, EOS is stuck maybe permanently in the no fees, high issuance camp. And you know, even Ethereum is, is moving towards a, a more fee revenue because there's a, this desire in the Ethereum community to reduce the, the inflation rate, right? Uh, and so far, we haven't found a system with no fees and no inflation, um, unless you're counting totally centralized systems. Uh, so, this is kind of the trade-off and the transition that a lot of chains are trying to make to get to maturity. Um, and then the question is, how do you design your fee model? So there are really two major schools of thought here. Uh, one you know, common in Bitcoin cash land is that um, with unlimited block space, you can have tons of applications, and all of those tiny fees will add up. And then th the other school is that you, know, you bite the bullet and you, you bound block space. You, know, you keep it scarce. Um, and then that induces a fee market to emerge as there's, you know, pressure to transact and the block space is considered valuable. Uh, so, you know, and I would actually put um, 
most Ethereum folks in the, the mile wide and inch deep camp uh, where there's a belief that if you have lots and lots of block space available, a lot of those small fees will add up and you know, constitute a security budget. So these are kind of the two main economic schools of thought almost. And then the question is, since the Bitcoin is in this camp where you know, we sort of acknowledge that fees are gonna have to be higher in the long term, maybe in the few dollars range, can Bitcoin, the system, charge for, uh, for, you know, for premium block space? Can Bitcoin charge users higher fees? Um, so you know, the, there's just a debate on this, I think, Probably the answer is yes, but I can't tell you for sure. So there are network effects. It's a kind of costly to move in and out from Bitcoin to Litecoin, then transact on Litecoin and come back to Bitcoin. That's a pain. Uh, and you're also exposing yourself to volatility and there's a market impact if you're doing a trade. So you know, even with atomic swaps, it's not ideal. Um, you might think that Bitcoin can charge a premium because Bitcoin's settlement assurances are better because there is so much security expenditure on Bitcoin your safest transacting on Bitcoin. And because Bitcoin has non-repurposable hardware, um, you know, maybe there's something special about Bitcoin block space. Um, and then you know, there are dedicated features of Bitcoin, like overlay networks like Lightning, which don't you know, apply necessarily to other chains. So maybe the answer is yes, and Bitcoin can charge a premium. I think this is actually the existential question, uh, which will determine whether people are willing to pay fees long term. Um, and, and then on the no side, there, there, there was a demonstrable feedback loop, negative feedback loop between transaction count, between fees and transaction count in 2017. So you saw this pattern repeat six times as fees, uh, a transaction count rose, blocks became super full, um, and, uh, and fees rose as a consequence. And then um, the, the high fees actually caused transactions to drop off. And you actually saw this this oscillation happen five or six times. Um, you know, and the other um, no reason would be that there are you know, functionally identical chains that exist out there um, you, you know, that, that you know, in theory could be understood as, uh, as networks to, to take in the excess capacity from transacting on Bitcoin. Paul Stork has, has talked a lot about this. Um, and then you know, perhaps some new blockchain system will, will come along which doesn't charge any fees but offers the same assurances as Bitcoin. In that case, Bitcoin probably couldn't charge a premium. So um, there's an interesting case study um, in 2017 again. You can see Bitcoin fees rising and either coincidentally or on a causal basis, you know, Litecoin transactions rose um, as fees were, were really high on Bitcoin. And I'm not suggesting this is causal Maybe it's just a coincidence, but there has been you know, some evidence of users using Litecoin as like an emergency spillway um, when Bitcoin was, was too difficult to transact on. So that sort of implies that maybe um, you, you know, people consider uh, Litecoin to be a, a maybe inferior alternative. Uh, and the truth is that the fees are actually pretty low right now. So fees are 2% of minor revenue. And today, fees are in the 100, 150K range. That annualizes to $50 million a year. So whether you think about the stock model or the threshold model, um, Bitcoin right now is probably not prepared to transition away from the issuance-led regime, right? So something may have to change. Um, one way to think about paying for fees would be to take the current security spend as a fraction of transaction value on Bitcoin. So Let's say block rewards went away today and we, we had to rely on fees exclusively. Right now, Bitcoin would have to charge half a percent on each transaction, um, you know, half a percent of the value of transactions um, to make up for that difference. But that's, that's actually not how Bitcoin is priced. As we all know, its price is a function of, of the bytes that you're using. So um, I, I don't know how, how amenable users would actually be to this state of affairs. Um, so then the question is, can we design for a robust fee market in the long term? Uh, is this even an appropriate thing to reason about? And actually lots of people, this talk actually might be a little controversial because um, there's this view that Bitcoin's parameters should be fixed and should not change and shouldn't introduce any alterations to the system. Um, and you, you know, we, we absolutely cannot bust the 21 million uh, cap, so, so perhaps it's illegitimate to reason about this. I, I don't think that's the case, actually. SegWit, in particular, 
you know, really altered the dynamics by opening up block space by a factor of two and a half, three. Um, so there is actually precedent for changing the block size, which is the main lever that I think you would use um, to, to induce a higher level of latent fees. So potentially th there could be an alteration um, in the form of a, of a lower block size. I'm not actually suggesting that. Um, my suggestion is make sure Bitcoin is used for high value transactions, which are the transactions where a fee is, is acceptable. Uh, so I call this economic density. Increase the economic density of Bitcoin block space so, so fees are, are sort of acceptable. And one way to do this is with an overlay network. So Lightning, for instance. Um, Lightning has many, many off-chain transactions, and then you know, there's periodic settlement registry and arbitration to the base layer um, you know, to inherit the security of the base layer. So each, each base layer transaction for Lightning at maturity could represent 100,000 or a million Lightning transactions. And so you would amortize those fees, even if it's a $10 fee, uh, you, you, know, you divide that into all of the constituent transactions. So maybe it's, you know, it would be OK paying a high fee for that, the, the periodic registry transaction. Um, and you know, how can you measure economic density? Well, we have all the data. So uh, your typical Bitcoin transaction is about $4,000 right now. So Bitcoin is actually very economically dense anyway. Uh, and you can, uh, you can divide the dollars being transacted by the bytes they're using. And so you, a typical byte on Bitcoin uh, out of that 230 byte uh, uh, gigabyte size, a typical byte um, is worth about $7 in terms of transactional value today. Uh, so, so Bitcoin is actually quite dense already. Um, so another approach is to, to increase the, the so-called semantic density of Bitcoin block space. Um, so what that means is is inserting lots of meaning into Bitcoin. And Merkle trees are great for this. So um, you know, you have protocols like open timestamps where you can inject some information into Bitcoin, uh, and actually many, many more such use cases. And in that case, you can insert you know, lots and lots of, of, uh, of sort of data into Bitcoin in the form of, of a single hash. Um, so it, th this, the amount of data that can be registered is potentially unbounded, but it all benefits from the assurances, you know, the timestamping assurances Bitcoin gives you. And, and so those use cases, there might be a willingness to pay a higher fee. Um, and actually, there's, there's a lot of services that do this, um, including some, some sort of new and upcoming um, identity registration services. Um, you've probably all seen Veriblock is using 20, 30% of, of Bitcoin's block space today. And, and what they're using that for is to um, export Bitcoin security elsewhere to other chains so they can inherit it or, or borrow it. And all they have to do is pay the fee. Veriblock has spent about 75 Bitcoins doing this in the last few months. So it's not a lot, but um, you know, if one of these use cases were to take off, or if there was an acknowledgment that you know, maybe some altcoins should Komodo-style borrow Bitcoin security to, to bolster their own, you know, maybe then there would be a large fraction of all Bitcoin transactions were, which were just being used for security inheritance. And in that case, you know, th that would be a, a positive tailwind um, for, for fee expenditure. Um, and you know, Paul Stork has also talked about merge mine side chains, drive chains. Um, these are all things that I think would, would these are transactions that are sort of economically significant um, outside of your conventional moving money around transactions where, where fees might sort of be considered acceptable. Um, so j just to briefly summarize, we're, we're not exactly sure what Bitcoin security model is um, outside of the, the kind of straightforward explanations Toshi gives us, um, there, is, there is a feeling in the community that it is the threshold model, um, that Bitcoin is just assumed secure at some level of security expenditure. I'm actually not sure if that's the case. If Bitcoin is a very valuable system, that means it's very valuable to attack. So the more valuable it gets, there's a concept that perhaps you should spend more in security. So you should spend a function of, of the value of the system in security every year. Maybe that's 3%, 1%, I'm not sure. Um, but so really the security model is, is a function of the adversarial conditions that you're imagining. Um, so we haven't really settled the question of, of stock flow threshold. 
Um, I think the, f the question of flow as introduced by Budish is an interesting one. That'll be a really interesting debate to follow. Um, but I believe that it's sort of universally acknowledged that a vibrant and stable fee market is sort of necessary for long-term security. Um, Arvin Naranyan has a paper where they talk about the instability of the, of the minor um, revenue in the long term if fees are zero or fees are erratic. Um, and so, you know, I think it's probably defensible to say that, uh, that fees should be, there should be some eminent fee pressure on Bitcoin in the long term. Um, but the question is, can Bitcoin be considered a premium place to transact? And probably most of the people in this room think it is, um, and I would agree. But can it retain that premium in the face of lots of competitors? That is the question that will you know, determine whether people are willing to pay fees or not. Uh, and my suggestion is that we should think about use cases that enhance the semantic and economic density, whether that's making large transactions on the, on the base layer, those are economically dense transactions, or other potential protocols uh, that are willing to pay higher fees. Those are kind of the keys to, to maximizing the long-term security budget, in my opinion. Thank you. Questions? Please come in the front. No Just a quick question, what is the timeline that you foresee, you know, um, given the happening next year, how, how soon do you think the fees need to be implemented? I think that, uh, so the question is, what's the timeline for fees to, to start to matter? Um, I, I don't think there's any immediate pressure. I know that my talk could be interpreted as fear-mongering to some degree, but um, I think probably in two halvings time, right now the the inflation rate is about 4% to having, so it'll be just under 1% um, of, of, yeah, of supply. So I think maybe in two halvings time is when we would want to see a fee to market, market to have developed by then. Um, so there, you know, there is a fee market on Bitcoin today. It's just not very pronounced. But yeah, in, in two, so 10 years time is, is when I would start to get concerned. Hey Nick, thank you for that. Um, I think the, the stock model becomes super interesting once the value of the whole network increases so much. Do you think it ever gets to a stage though where the onus isn't on the, the transactors of the network to pay high fees, but is on the, the people like custodians or like big wealth holders to help secure that network as a, as a mechanism to, I guess, protect their wealth and protect the Bitcoin that they own? That's fascinating. So do you mean, um do you mean that there should be some inflation because long-term holders should be suffering the cost of Yeah, almost like an operational cost or... I think so, it, but, so I mean, that's really how it works today, right? If, if you hold Bitcoins for the long term, you are suffering some amount, small amount of inflation. Um, but do you mean, uh, as in custodians should be setting money aside to go to miners to support them? Uh, yeah, or even for mining themselves to secure the network. Uh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, uh, it's an, I think it, it's almost something that um, my colleagues, former colleagues at Fidelity think about because they mine and they're a custodian. So I think there is some awareness that, um, you know, they're, they're benefiting economically from the security of Bitcoin and maybe they should be doing their fair part. So I think they're very progressive in thinking about that. It's just hard to design a mechanism that mm. makes it work, you know, mining uneconomically is a, it's probably not going to work in the long term. Awesome. Thank you. Hi. Um, do you think Bitcoin will only be confined within like affluent societies? Like uh, there's like uh, China and then South Korea and then India all with their like advancements and development within like the digital currency atmosphere? Or do you see like a uh, cryptocurrency just acting like a financial intermediary because like if the financial world, it's like, they might diverge and then it's gonna be like a fiat aspect situation 
would they be somewhat similar to like a Chase, MasterCard, PayPal? I think the real challenge is, um, you know, is achieving a really high level of transactions on the base layer, and I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. What I think will happen is that we'll have a development, a layered development, which we're already seeing to some degree, where nobody transacts individually on the base layer in the future. Um, they will have access to cheap, you know, Bitcoin security assurances, but at a higher level. And Lightning is the start of that, and I'm sure that cash-like instruments will be issued against Bitcoin, um, you know, in the future. So, long answer is that I think Bitcoin will be a really powerful force for financial inclusion, and it will give normal folks access to transactions for cheap, but probably not at the base layer. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, the impact of a potentially a short seller um, conducting a 51% attack. Whatever the estimate of costs that would that would that would incur for 51% attack in the billions of dollars, right? Um, I just we work in the capital markets around derivatives, and we just don't see the kind of like liquidity that would be available for a short seller to even execute something like that. I mean, you look at exchanges or BitMax. I mean, it wouldn't even come close. So, like, what does the world look like after a 51% attack in terms of selling into the market, whatever you shorted, right? Yeah. So the I think uh, the point you're making to some degree is: Are there sort of institutional protections in place? Um, correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, such that short sellers actually can't really monetize their. It wouldn't be able to, because of volume, right? They're selling into this depressed market, and there's just not enough liquidity in derivatives for them to execute the sale. Yeah, so I think right now the liquidity is not sufficient mm -hmm. to execute an attack like that. However, there are futures um, venues that are being created right now, uh, backed as one, mm -hmm. uh, which would be. Um, you know, more powerful infrastructure uh, and, in theory, more liquid. So I don't think we can, uh, you know, assume this, that the status quo will persist forever. And I would be uncomfortable couching Bitcoin security on the fact that the secondary markets aren't very liquid right, right now. So it's some, I think it's something to still contemplate. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nick.